ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ Bruce? Is this Lionel? Yeah, I don't come down to the mailroom very often. Uh, especially during the day, so I'm either in trouble or there's exciting things <laughs> that transpire. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> especially during the day. <laughs> it's, even creep- yes. it's even creepier at night. But it could be the nighttime when people are listening. It is creepier at night, but you know the the the, the critters keep me company at night, so it's not uh, too bad. Yeah. Uh, it, to, uh, this podcast is truly going to exemplify the magic of the AML Nation. Oh, wow. Because we're going to talk to a fellow named Rob Fell, F-E-L. Ah, yes, okay. And he lives in Switzerland. And and we've been corresponding back and forth via messenger uh, about getting testing his audio, and then uh, mm-hmm. because there's a seven hour time difference between the stu- between where we are and he is, I flew him into the studio. <laughs> Attaboy. boy! And uh, was Scott Lister at the controls? Oh, absolutely. Scott Scott tables is table the table master. Not only sets up the booth, he's also and is in charge of pizza parties. He's also. Uh, are the in charge of aviation? He's the vice president. Aviation wing. Yeah, he's the vice president in charge of aviation. And uh, there we go. Yeah, and and you know what? Before the, you know the first thing he does, the last thing he does before he d- takes off on any flight, tells you to keep your hands off the controls. No, he checks for the weather with Kelly. <laughs> Oh, checks weather, Kelly. Ah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and then Tech Kelly tells him, "Oh no, don't go there. You're gonna die." <laughs> and he goes, and nothing's nothing yeah. happens. Yeah, exactly. See, uh, the, the best Kelly could do for weather forecast is mainly dark tonight with increasing light towards dawn. Exactly. That's Ke- yeah. It's a yeah. It'll be uh, continuous. That's, that's what he should be limited to. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be continuing darkness towards nightfall, <laughs> with periods of light, yeah. with periods of uh, with periods of sun the next day. Um, yes, I was like when I first started going between the southern studio and the and the northern studio, and the first time I ever flew yes. flew back from the southern studio to the northern studio in the dead of winter. It was one of those gray, dull winter days. And, <laughs> well, the perfect ones, you can never tell what the time it is because nothing changes yeah. as far as lighting. And I texted somebody and they said, what's the weather like? I said, it's uh, it's uh, overcast with a chance of dismal. <laughs> there you go. Which would be true. <laughs> yeah, which would be true. Uh, I got a feeling this is on the free channel. Okay. So uh, this podcast, as with all podcasts on the free channel, and in actual fact, everything that happens in the AML Nation is uh, sponsored by our friends over there at Rapido Trains. Your fast track to model railroading fun. Rapido Trains, your fast track to model railroading fun. I wonder how many of those 44 tonners are going to sell. That's all I can talk about. Oh, I, I think they're going to sell thousands of them. I know. I, I, think, I, I think they'll be uh, unbelievably overwhelmed by the, the number of pre-orders they get, and they'll be happily working on whatever the second coming of those is and but yeah they're going to be wildly wildly popular yeah they are they're going to be uh very very popular it's going to be a very cool it's going to be one of those it's going to be one of those things that you buy lots of people are going to buy them that don't need them for starters yep and i mean talk about talk about the the evolution of shelf layouts or the popularity of shelf layouts now is there is there any bot better model for for motive power on a shelf layout than a forty four tonner? Nope. That's where they'd. Fa- I think I'd build this. I I think I'd build a small shelf layout just to have a forty four tonner to run back and forth. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the one I would build for this forty four tonner would be the gum 
gum stump and snowshoe. What was that? Snowshoe. Yes, the gum, the gum stump and snowshoe. The uh, little switchback layout to the upper level, similar to what uh, our late friend uh, Jim Sacco uh, kind of based his uh, City Classics layout on. Oh, did he really? I did not. Yeah. I did not know that. It's one yeah, of my it was roughly roughly based on that. It's where it's one of my favorite shelf layouts of all time. I wonder yeah. if I wonder if I can yeah. find the plan for that. Let's have this is going to be one of the one of our favorite parts. Oh, of, I, 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 favorite part googling for gum stump. <laughs> yeah, you know, Lionel does the internet. Look at that! All you got to put in is gum stump, and it comes up. Wow, that's it's crazy! Shoe track. Look at that! There's a whole pile of images for it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um. Uh. There's one in O scale. It's a very cool layout. That would be ideal for a 44 tonner. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, it would be. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yep. I'm, I might have to build. That might actually get me. Actually, that'd be fun to do for uh, an, an S scale as well. Hmm. S scale would be ideal. An S scale. I wonder what the actual. And I, and I think I think you can get an S scale 44 tonner. The guy who would know would be Scott, but I'm sure, I'm sure I've seen kits out there for 44 tonners for S scale. Uh, well, Scott has a couple of 44 tonners on his layout. So, you know, well, he has 75. I think he has 75 tenders. Oh, okay. I thought he had a 44 turn. All right. Well, you know what? It would work I with think his, his 75. You know, it would e work. Either one, it, either one it would work with. Yeah. And uh, I'll just go and visit him and, you know, borrow, you borrow one with sticky you, fingers. Yeah. Just kind of, just kind of distract him. Is that, is that a bunch of cheese ball containers over in the corner mm -hmm. there, Scott? What? Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. Or start chewing them out that there wasn't enough uh, chicken wings in Springfield or something. Yeah. And, while he's yeah. busy getting chewed out, I'll just, uh, <laughs> or I'll chew him out. That's what I'll do. I'll chew him out, and then I'll go, and just, just uh, as uh, to show you that the, how serious this is, I'm going to take one of these 75 tonners for now and keep it, and maybe you'll start to appreciate having more chicken wings at the next pizza party. There you go. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, but there's actually a place in. Uh, Pennsylvania called gum stump. There is, yes. I didn't know that. How did you know that? I've heard of it. I heard of it before somewhere. Somebody's talking about gum stump being a natural place. So, uh, gum yeah. stump is an unincorporated community in Boggs Township, Center County, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's about five miles northwest of Belafonte, and uh, the seat of Center, the county seat of Center County. The elevation is one thousand one hundred feet. The Belafonte and Snowshoe Railroad switchbacks are lo located there. The switchbacks are the inspiration for Chuck, uh, Chuck uh, Younggirth's Younger, model. Younggirth. Younggirth, a uh, railroad. Well, anyways, uh, long story short, the uh, Rapido Trains 44-tonner is going to be the ideal locomotive for that particular layout. Holy there you go. Absolutely. Oh, holy Man. mackerel. Oh, they, they should they should package they they should include a copy of the track plan with each forty four tonner. That's not a bad idea, actually, isn't it? Huh. And it's in central. I didn't even know there was such a thing as uh, the switchbacks of this particular railroad. Hmm. I've quite. heard of Belafonte and Gumstone, but I never kind of put the two together. That uh, yeah, the Belafonte. Belafonte. I'm not sure how. They're... Yeah, the yeah. Belafonte and Snowshoe Railroad was a coal hauling railroad in Central County, Pennsylvania, begun in 1859. It came under control of Pennsylvania Railroad in 1881. Closing of the mines in 1930 resu resulted in a decline in traffic, which was abandoned in 1959. The line was originally chartered the Allegheny and Bald Eagle Railroad, coal and iron. Wow, it just goes on and on. Hmm. Well, look at that. I've learned something here today. Well, that's all the time we have, there folks. You go. Yeah, well, okay. So our email address, if anybody wants to uh, let us know about their version of the gum stump and stuff. Too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, Rapido Trains, if you want to go and buy one of these cool 44 tonners or any of the other multitude of products they have, just go to rapidotrains.com. And yes, and, indeed. And then and there you are, your fast track to model railroading. Yeah, fun. you're right. Even when you go to the even when you go to the website, it's your fast track to model railroading fun. 
Absolutely. So and the one thing we should point out is their website is really cool and you can order there, but I know Jason would prefer you deal with your, your local model hobby sh- railroad uh, hobby shop retailer because they're big on supporting the local shops because without them, we won't have much. That's right. And this will have uh, long since, I, by the time this is aired, I hopefully I will have remembered, but I got to send an e- uh, email to Jason because he wants to come on the show and talk about uh he wants to talk about uh business and uh the business and uh pre-orders and what how the business has changed a, a little bit again so that'd be cool i hope i remember uh, hey josh andrew chuck if i don't remember send me a message will you um okay so what's the here's the deal there's this guy named rob fell and yes uh, wait, let's get him into the studio it's been 10 minutes rob come into the studio Okay, here I am. <laughs> there, there he is. Look at that, uh, Rob. First question: You weren't into the shrimp, were you? I didn't. I didn't touch the shrimp. It uh, looked fairly odd. Uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, so fair, fairly is the nice way of describing it. So, Rob lives in where in Switzerland. Yes, that's right. And and you're a huge fan of the podcast. I am. I listened to most of them twice, actually. <laughs> And how did you find it? Uh, that's a good question there. Um, I think that was maybe around four to five years ago on YouTube. I have no idea why. Just was watching some Russian traffic accident videos and somehow <laughs> it showed me up the, the link to the to the AML podcast. I don't remember the first one, um, actually, but that was around four to five years ago. Okay. And you said that was a good question. Are you concerned that some of the questions going forward won't be? No, all of them are good, actually. Uh, oh, okay. And it's not on me to decide which one is not good. <laughs> so, uh, he's learned. Yeah, he's, he, I has, did, I did. he has been listening, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, so you contact, you, you, you sent in a few messages and a couple emails, and, and because you model North American stuff, which is not why you listen to the podcast, you just stumbled across it, and... We were messaging back and forth, and then I said, geez, we should get you on the podcast. And then you said this week was particularly good because the the job you've had uh, up till recently is a locomotive engineer in Switzerland. Yes, that's correct. That was until October of last year. How, how long did you do that? Um, that was a total of uh, four years, and I worked for the railroad for about 10 years, nine and a half, 10 years. In the last uh, four years, uh, I worked as a locomotive engineer for the passenger car service. Okay, and now you're and now you're going to leave that, and you're going to become a police officer. Yes, I started the new school um, at uh, October of last year, and just uh, one month before I left the railroad. And why why the why the switch? Did you get tired of working for the railroad, or? Yes. Somehow, yes, I bored out a little bit, even though it was it was a great time there and a great company and all that, but I just somehow bored out a little bit. And actually, the thing is, I had two kind of dream jobs when I was a little boy, and uh, one of them was locomotive engineer, and the second one was a police officer. So now that I worked for four years for locomotive engineer, I decided to, to try to apply for the police academy, and well, for some reason, they took me, so I started there. Wow, so you got to be pretty proud of yourself. Uh, are, you, are you married? Uh, I am not, but I have a beautiful girlfriend who lives with me here in Zug in Switzerland. That's kind of in the middle of the country, actually. How do you spell that? Um, Zulu Uniform Golf. Z- Zulu Uniform Golf. Oh, this is Z U G. Oh, Z U G. I feel like I yeah, should... and a little fun fact: this town uh, is actually the the word means uh, train. Really? Yes. Oh, there you go. Yes, oh, okay. that's total true. I... <laughs> uh, okay, I found it. There it is. It's not that far from Zurich, and so where? No, it is not. It's like uh, thirty minutes by car. And are you going to be a police officer in Zug or somewhere else? No, um, I work uh, in the. Canton, uh, Canton is what we you guys call a state, okay, or a district. Uh, we call them uh, Canton, um, and I will work in Lucerne, which you might know. Yeah, Lucerne's yeah. just down the road from uh, where you're from Zug. 
probably. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, 30 minutes in the other direction. Okay. Wow, cool. So you're halfway. And I work there as a locomotive engineer as well. Oh, really, eh? I feel like there's a thousand questions I should be asking you about being a locomotive engineer. (laughs) Well, then start with number one. (laughs) Well, how did you get involved in model railroading? Um, That goes back to, oh, gee, um, I think that all started when I was at the age of six to seven years old, maybe. My very first kind of train was a Lego train set. Right. Um, I guess you guys have that in Canada as well. Lego, Lego, I don't know how you spell it. Lego. Lego, yes, exactly. Uh, It all started with that, and then I just went down the road. Um, At the age of nine, I got my first starter set from Merclean. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, And then I collected some trains and rolling stock uh, together with my dad. Uh, That was back then when we lived in Hungary. Uh, because we were there for about 10 to 12 years. Okay. And when we came back to, to Switzerland, I was at the age of 12 to 13. I think I was 12, actually. And then, yeah, new school and a new new place to live. So I just somehow lost the connection to the hobby. And after the military, uh, it all started over again. I just somehow uh, tipped in model trains on YouTube. And then I found some some train videos, some layouts and some books and, and weathering videos and stuff like that. And I just somehow uh, started to um, to collect some trains again. But that was when I left uh, Merklin and I started to collect uh, North American prototypes. Oh, that's when you left Marklin? Yes. Okay. Um, you got very good English. Is English kind of... What, what, I, I, I try my best here. Yeah. <laughs> what, what got you interested in North American prototype? Um, I think that was uh, the book of a fellow gentleman called Pell Söberg, which you okay, guys yeah. might know from Train Life. The, the layout, which is there in their store, is actually built by Pell Söberg. And uh, this guy wrote, I think, a total of four books or five, and I got all five of them. And he is from Denmark, and uh, he models Union Pacific. And I just somehow stumbled across his book. I uh, there was a picture on the on the front page with the UPG Vo, and I think that was the the second when I when I went nuts for American trains. So I immediately sold all my Merklin European stuff, and then I started to to do some extensive research on the internet. What is American trains? Which companies are out there? How can I get them? And then I started to um, to collect uh, piece by piece and one by one. That is cool. That is so cool. So how long have you been modeling the North American? Well, that's, uh, I think it's a total of, um, after the military, I got my first Dash 9. So that it is about seven years or eight years now, something around those lines. I think it's a total of eight years now. So uh, how long were you in the military? Uh, I was there for um, 430 days. (laughs) <laughs> not not that you were counting <laughs> no no not at all <laughs> is that uh, no is, the thing is it's it's not voluntary here in switzerland it's still mandatory which is a good thing i think right and um i chose to to um what is a, a sergeant it's it's not an officer it's just below that okay you got as far as sergeant yes okay um wow this is wh- which branch of the military were you in infantry infantry okay can you get? Can I can't get over this, Bruce? We're actually talking to a guy from Switzerland. How oh, cool! I know that lives halfway between Zurich and Lucerne. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what a! It's it's the marvel, the marvel of the modern world, man. I know, but I mean, it is. It is the marvel of the modern world, but it's also the marvel of the AML nation. This exactly this, this yes. crazy thing we started that we're having a conversation. With Rob and and it's like it's easy to talk to him because he's familiar with the podcast and wow it's just uh this is uh endlessly fascinating um so is it, so is your first name just Rob or is that like a, a North American version of no your- um I already wanted to to make a little correction there so I I only use Rob Fell on Facebook for for some reasons and um, my full name is actually Robin Felder okay okay. Robin, like as an uh, op- I just use it on, on Facebook so that it's not so yeah. easy to, to find me because uh, 
back in the days, I had just too many people asking again and again for, for friendship and all that stuff. Uh, and now I actually only use Facebook for, for modeling reasons because research and, uh, and messaging is, is way easier with Facebook. For example, with Tim Garland or Tom Klimowski, or when I have a question to, uh, to Scott Thornton about the product throttle, it's just so much easier uh, via Facebook than it is via email. All right, back up there, sport. <laughs> Let's back that <laughs> back that bus up there a couple of stops. So you you regularly message with Tim Garland? Um with Tim actually, yes. Okay, and how did that get started? That gets started uh, through his YouTube channel, the Seaboard Central. Um so as a matter of fact, I model mostly NS East Coast stuff and I just somehow stumbled across his channel on YouTube. Uh, I have no idea when that was. That was one of the first YouTube channels, I think, that I found out there, which I really liked from right from the beginning when he was building his first layout. And then uh, I just searched for his name online and never could find him. And then one day I found um, a comment on the AML fan site, uh, on, the, on the Facebook page for the AML uh, podcast and then I found his name there which he uses on, on Facebook and then just I messaged him um, through Messenger there and uh, that's when we started uh, chatting back and forth from time to time and I told him I worked for the railroad and all that and uh, yeah I really hope to to meet him one day maybe he's coming to Switzerland actually wow that's just I cannot believe <laughs> this has turned into this simply from and and they and and they can and they're concerned that the hobby. Some people are concerned the hobby might be dying. Uh huh. No, eh. that's absolutely not true. I always have to laugh when I hear that. Yeah, I know. But it's the same here, actually. A lot of people are talking about, yeah, this hobby is more mostly for older people and all that, and the young people are not interested in this. That's that's total bullshit, if it, you ask me. It is. It is complete uh, cow poop. Uh, because because how old are you? Did I already ask you? I'm thirty years old. Uh, no, you're, you didn't. You're 30 years old, and you've already been in yes, the military sir. for 420 days. You've been worked for the railroad for 10 years, and now you're going to become a, a police officer, like a state police officer. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> huh. Boy, I, I'm starting to feel bad about my life. <laughs> Oh, the, <laughs> I, you don't have to. I just really like uh, the, the post you do, like live like it matters. Uh, that, that's actually totally true. It is totally true. Absolutely. But I think about the only thing I've done in my life is eat hot dogs and play hockey. Um, <laughs> well, if you like hot dogs, then that's a good thing. <laughs> this is so cool. This is going to be another lousy podcast because it's just me going to be going, this is so cool. I'm sitting here. I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting in Florida. Bruce is in uh, 40 miles north of Toronto, and Rob is in yeah. uh, Zug, uh, S uh, Switzerland, halfway between Luzerne and Zurich. And I'm going to just for the next... And, and I'm just down the road, 25 miles down the road from the Daytona International Speedway, which I'm going to go hang out there this weekend because it's a big weekend for racing down there. And it's like, this is just the goofy... I got the goofiest life now. It's just crazy. So... uh so you're you're a typical model railroader. You just happen to be in Switzerland, and because of YouTube and the new world and social media, you stumbled across Tim Garland's uh, uh, YouTube videos, which are great. And from that, you started messaging, and you struck up a friendship with Tim. Yes, that's correct. And then you said Tim uh, Tom Klamoski. You talked to him too, as well. Um, yeah, I sent him some notes when I was in the in the planning phase uh, for my own uh, for my own switching layout which I am currently working on uh, but we don't talk regularly uh, with Tom I just uh, right. had some questions and then he helped me there right but uh, but I mean, it and must... of course I bought his book of course um it must feel though let me ask you this question this is uh, this is a typical Lionel question uh does it feel to you this is you're the perfect guy to ask this question to does it feel to you like, uh, as far as model railroading goes, there are no bounds. The world is your oyster. There's people from all over the world to talk to, and it's much more, it's much more interactive it's, than people realize. Oh, I actually agree 100% on that. Yeah. Like, I think that's the key. Is For several reasons. I think internet is, is one of the big things which allows us to, to connect internationally. 
Um, it makes research way easier. I mean, you can go to, to Google Street View and check out some industries which you want to build on your own layout. But not only that, it, it makes just connecting with other people and, and, and asking them stuff so much more easier. And also it, it allows for new, for new friends. Um, and who knows, maybe one day you can arrange a, a meeting with one of the guys you just met like 10 years before on the internet. And now you can operate some trains together. Yeah, man, if you ever came to the, if you ever came to the U S you'd be, you'd have to take like uh, a month just to visit all the people that you would connect with through the AML nation. Holy mackerel. Yeah, that's very true. I actually already have a couple of guys who told me I, I really have to, to contact them when I come to the U.S. Uh, for example, uh, Josh from NS Modeler 24, which you interviewed before. Oh, yeah. Already. Yep. You he talk has such an amazing layout. I mean, that this this guy is, is crazy. This this layout is just amazing. We got to get him back on the podcast. I get more and more. Yes, he you ma- should. <laughs> he, makes great, he makes great videos, too um and absolutely his uh, weathering and the signaling system is amazing yeah and it's modeler 2024 i think it is isn't it and yep. mo- yep. yes that's correct now do you have a face uh, you say you have a facebook page about your rail or your railroading like would you just is no i i don't have a page um but i regularly post in some other groups for example the dho scale shelf layout modelers i make some yep. posts regularly there okay and I made uh, some little posts on your web, uh, on your fans page on Facebook as well. Okay. All right. But other, like, but you quite often, have, you quite uh, often sends me updates, which I tell in the post. What's that? He quite often, what's that? He quite often sends me a message with his latest goings on. I tell him, post that on the fans page. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bruce always uh, told me to, to post it on the fans page. <laughs> so that's what I did. Oh, good. Good. That's perfect. Man, I'm just like uh, I can't get an I can't get enough of this. We're only already thirty minutes in, and we've got to make sure I ask a lot of good questions. Um, okay, so what? How big is? Because yeah, you've sent in emails to us showing us some of your modeling, haven't you? Yes, that's right. I sent yeah. about two or three mails. I think the last one went out three days ago or okay. four days ago. Oh, perfect. Um, you got to keep checking in with us because. We're dying to hear about your progress and and your life. I mean, uh, you got an incredibly interesting life already. Um, must be it must be in Switzerland quite an involved process to become a police officer. It's a it's a two year long um, school actually. Um, the first year is um, for most part all the theoretical stuff, like all the all the laws and all that. And the second year we are actually going out for real. Oh yeah, right in the front line. And after these two years, um, we got a kind of a certification, and that we are uh, full commissioned police officers. Then, wow. And uh, and this is going to sound very North American, very uh, un- uneducated comment, but I'm going to make it anyways because I'm interested to talk to you about other things other than railroading. But I'm assuming that. Uh, being a police officer in Switzerland, although it's probably all over the world now, so that's kind of, but being a police officer in Switzerland is very, uh, you got to be careful of international intrigue and international, uh, you know, violence and, you know, terrorists. You got to be very concerned about terrorists in Switzerland. Well, I think maybe not not terrorists for the most part, but since Switzerland is a small country, we have uh, we have more to deal with uh, international. How would I say that? Maybe bandits or, or gangsters, okay. for example, the the drug the the drug um, traffickers, um, and also um, you know, since since the European Union doesn't really control its borders, it's it's way easier to, for example, go to another country. Uh, break into a house, steal from some stuff, go into the car, and then um, head over the over the border. Oh, okay. It's way easier than it was when when the border was was completely closed and everybody uh, gets controlled. And with with new European memberships and all that stuff, even though Switzerland is not a real member of the EU, um, it is way easier to go uh, over the border. Okay. Do I, I think I'm on your page now? Do you have a Ford Explorer? Yes, that's right. <laughs> That was always my biggest dream, that car. And uh, <laughs> last year I bought one. Oh, yeah? I bet you like that, yes. eh? Yes. It's, oh, my God, I love this car. It's it's fantastic. <laughs> and Ford Explorers in uh, in uh, North America are very popular to be used as police vehicles. 
Yes, uh, actually, that's not a coincidence. If I'm, if I'm to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wondered that when I saw uh, it. That was in in 2015. I was in Los Angeles with my lovely girlfriend, and then then there was the the first of the new generation. Of, I think it's the fifth generation of Ford Explorer. Uh, right, it's called the, the Interceptor. The, the police calls them interceptors. Yeah, and we were in Los Angeles, and there was this beautiful LAPD vehicle. And I was like, who the hell makes this car? I have never seen this before. <laughs> and I checked out on the internet and then I have just seen, okay, Ford just started the new generation of Explorers in 2014. Oh, look at you. And that was the moment I decided to start, get some money together and buy a Ford Explorer <laughs> as soon as I can. <laughs> uh, um, I guess we're like, hey, I was going to go and buy the old Crown Victoria, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's a fantastic car as well. Uh huh. So, is uh, our North American cars fairly popular in in, uh, in Switzerland? Absolutely not. <laughs> there are some guys who who love them, but it's mostly mostly car enthusiasts and, and collectors. Uh, the thing is, even even with an Explorer, which is not a full size SUV in the US and Canada, you, it's, it's a headache to to park this this car. Yeah. Um our parking lots are extremely small, the roads are extremely small, Switzerland in particular because it's a small country. Um yeah, it's it's a pain in the butt to, to move this vehicle around, but I just simply love it. So yeah. I had like, to get it. It's like owning a Dodge Ram pickup truck in uh in in, in England. You see guys you Yeah, see, yeah. You'll see guys with Dodge or uh, Mirror North. So where is the nearest Ford dealer to you? Um that's around 30 minutes from where i live it's a small village it's actually not really a town uh i can't remember the town okay so it's about 30 um, it's also th- is everything is everything 30 minutes from where you live yeah believe it or not from where i live actually <laughs> it is, uh, because i'm just so so um i'm located pretty in the middle of the country right and, um if, if i have to go to Bern, it's about an hour or maybe a bit more if i go to lucerne it's 30 minutes if i go to zurich it's 30 minutes right yeah yeah uh, but that's mostly for the reason that that switzerland is, is i mean it's just a tiny little country well, especially sure. compared with, with canada so how long would it take you uh uh to get to, uh, so getting to geneva looks like it would t- take like three hours to get to geneva yeah that's a bit, bit more and it really depends on traffic i think Two to three hours would be would be realistic. Okay, um, let's get back to Mo. Um, I, I, I might be faster by train, actually. Oh, very, okay, so let's get let's investigate more about this. You being a locomotive engineer for uh, in Switzerland, so it was primarily passenger trains, and passenger trains in Europe are far, far more uh, efficient than they are in North America. So what, like, like how would where would you run from and to? when you were a locomotive engineer? Okay, so um, I didn't work for the Federal Railway in Switzerland. It was a, it was a small company which is owned by the Federal Railway. Um, it was called the Central Railroad. And I um, drove from Lucerne to Engelberg. Okay. And to Interlaken East. Maybe you have, you've heard that before. Uh, what did you say, Interlaken East? Interlaken East, yes. We had a lot of American and Canadian guests on our trains in, di- in this direction, actually. Huh. I don't even... I see I see Engelberg. Man, that Engelberg seems like it's out in the middle of nowhere. Did you used to post... Did you... It is. It's a touristic hotspot. Oh, okay. Some of the, some of the roads in Switzerland aren't very straight. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> What was the other? You have po- to go around all the mountains we have. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, let me ask you this question: Is is, is how long have you lived in Switzerland now? Um, so we came back home to Switzerland from Hungary when I was twelve, and for eighteen years now. Okay, and uh, so is it as is it as magnificent and beautiful as it appears to be to live in Switzerland? It is. It is. Wow, that's so cool. Um, what, what kind of questions, Bruce, can we ask him about being a locomotive engineer? Like, I mean, how uh, did you ever, have you posted pictures of being, uh, being in the, lo- man, it looked like you were working a, a console for a music concert or something. The, some of the pictures you posted <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, was it, 
was it, I mean, in uh, North America, they're coming up with uh, PTC, which is positive train control, which is, I'm concerned it's taking more and more of the fun away from the locomotive engineer. Like in, in Switzerland, when you were, when you were a locomotive engineer, was it pretty much, uh, what's the word? Automatic or hands on versus sitting back. Yeah. Was it hands on or was it more automatic and automated? Automated is the word I'm thinking of. Well, that, that really depends on which vehicle you are using. So I am uh, familiar with PTC for a little bit. Um, we have a, a similar um, technical system which works here as well. It's called uh, ETCS, European Train Control System. But we, we didn't have that on our uh, on the company where I work because it was a, it was a narrow gauge. Actually, it's a narrow gauge railroad, and we also used cogwheels to go uphill. All right. So it's not that typical kind of railroad. It's a small narrow gauge railroad with very steep climbs, and uh, we had a we had a different system. But it's it's hands on actually. So yes, the the vehicles get more and more autonomous, but we still have to drive them themselves. It's just kind of like you have, um, like in your car, you have cruise control and stuff like that, but you still have to open the doors, close the doors, and you are the one deciding whether the train moves or not. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Now, now, when when you were you're saying you uh, you mentioned cogwheels, so, so when you were going for interlock and uh, you're heading up into the mountains and uh, or across the mountains. Yes, exactly. So we started in Lucerne, and you go uh, the maximum speed on some parts of the of the of the rail network, which is the the whole rail network is about 140 kilometers. I think that comes up to around 100 miles. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, just, just I under. use metric system here, so I always get confused with miles and all that stuff. So the some little parts of the network we were allowed to go with 100 kilometers per hour, which I think is about 65 miles per hour, something around those lines. Oh, 62 and, and a bit, yep. Yeah, uh, 62. Close enough. And and then in Giesville, we had to slow down to to around three to four miles an hour, and we have wow. to to move the train into the cogwheel systems. And once the whole train is in there, uh, then the train goes 30 to 40%. It uses the cog wheels and 60% adhesion. So the regular uh, wheels, actually. And the combination of those two allowed the train to go uphill um, 11 to 12% um, climbing uphill. And the maximum speed allowed in the cog wheel system, once the whole train was in, was 40 kilometers an hour. And how, what's the gauge? Is it three foot? Um, I think that comes to three foot. It's 1,000 millimeters, so one meter oh, so, so, the, so the meter gauge, okay. Yes, exactly. About, about, about 39 inches. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, yeah, I have no idea about the inches, but it's, it's, it's one meter straight. Yeah, don't feel bad. I have no idea. And uh, actually, I started as a, as a track worker for, for maintenance department. That's what I did after school. I worked there. And then I just worked my way up until I became locomotive engineer. You were a conductor first, probably. No, it's 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 a bit different here. We have we have one man crews here or one person crews. We have also a female locomotive engineers, of course. Um, you you drive the train alone. You have a conductor, uh, depending on if it's a long range train or um, if it is a. So, for example, an, an interregio train is always. Um, you have always a conductor, but on a on a small commuter train, you drive the train by yourself. That always, uh, I know, I know our buddy uh, Serge Lebel. He drives those gigantic org trains on the Quebec North Shore and Labrador, and uh, yep. I always find that to be fascinating. One guy in charge of a whole train, <laughs> like that, just <laughs> it, it just blows your mind. You know, it just blows my mind, really, just to even think about it. And Do so, they have one man crews there? Well, on this particular railroad, the Quebec North Shore and Labrador, which runs out of Septil, Quebec, which is uh, in the eastern part of Canada, on uh, out there on the lake at the Saint end of the, River. yeah, at the end of the Saint Lawrence River. Uh, yeah, that that particular railroad uses one man crews. Most of the railroads use a minimum of two-man crews. But yeah, on that particular railroad, they do. It's a fellow that we interviewed sometime, uh, Serge LaBelle, you should look it up. we got to get him back on here again, too. I think I have checked that one out. 
Yeah. The thing is, since now that I'm a, a Patreon member, I have access to, to way more content and I don't really remember which ones I listened already <laughs> and which ones I did not. So it's, it's, it get, gets confusing sometimes. Well, sure. There's it all been, becomes a blur. Yeah, it all becomes a blur because you know what, uh, Rob? The sun never sets on the, on the AML Nation. We have listeners yeah, all, right. all over the world. So listeners all over the world. So the sun never sets on it. So, and then, so, man, what a fascinating railroad that you, you ran on. And how far would be the route that you went on this, on this particular run? Oh, we operated the whole network. I worked on the whole network. I know. But like when you got on the train and you went to, what was the place called? Ing Ingle, Ingleberg. When you went, Ingleberg, yes. yeah. So what did you run from Ingle, from, uh, uh, did you run from Lucerne to Ingleberg? Yeah, so so my main base, if you want to call it that way, uh, was Lucerne. Uh, we had four locations for our cruise. Um, I, I was uh, located in, in, in Lucerne. That's when my shift started. So I took the train, I went to Engelberg, and then I came back. And then uh, maybe I had a lunch break, or then I went to the next train straight, and that's how the shift Okay, so it went along the day. So it didn't take that long to get. It doesn't take that long to get to Ingleberg from Lucerne by no, train. No, it was it was about fifty to fifty five minutes, and then when you arrived uh, on top of there, you had seven minutes to turn the train. You went to the to the cab control for the downhill um, because uphill it's always the locomotive on that particular um, right. line yeah. to Engelberg. Uphill, you went with the locomotive, and downhill, you you used the cab control system. Then you went back to Lucerne and and. Uh, Depending on which shift you had, you actually went back to Engelberg straight away and then back again. And then you had lunch break and then you did something else. We had a lot of commuter trains as well. Okay. And Engelberg wouldn't be a commuter place, would it? It would be a, a strictly tourism up there. Yeah. it's. I, if I would have to guess, I would say it's about 80 to 90% tourism in Engelberg itself. And the commuter trains, uh, these were smaller ones. They didn't have the cogwheels. So they only went until Stanz and then you went back to Lucerne. And oh. only the, the, the cogwheel equipped train went to Engelberg. Okay. And have you met any, you said you talked to Scott Thornton as well from uh, Proto Throttle and his own little business of Scott's Models. But you have a Proto Throttle, do you? I do have since about a week. Well, really? Just oh. a week? Yes, yes. Uh, I bought one second hand from a gentleman who made a post in the in the Proto Throttle Enthusiast group on Facebook, and he offered his one to to sell, and so I went jumped right in and bought it, and he delivered it via USPS. It all worked out fine, and now I have my own Proto Throttle. Wow! And what do you? Uh, uh, Excellent. Yeah, that's going to be cool. Listen, uh, listening to you tell about how you get that thing going. So, how big is your? Uh, how big is your layout? Okay, so so the layout isn't that big actually because I don't have a big room for it. I just have a little small uh, hobby room, if sure. you call it that sure, way. Yeah. I have that since two years, and uh, the shelves or I have four shelves, which comes out to a total of four meters by zero point five meters. So four meters is roughly twelve feet long, uh, thirteen feet yes. long, thirteen feet long, I guess technically, and by and by a, roughly a foot and a half wide. 18 inches, 19 inches Yes, exactly. Wide. And at each segment comes one comes down to foot and a half wide to three foot long. And that uh, allows me a total of uh, 1.5 by 12 or 13 feet. All right. But you, okay. Well, you got to keep posting pictures on the fans page because either I that, promise I will do so. Yeah. Either that or post more on your, because uh, that's uh, going to be cool to follow along with that. And uh, man, you know who he needs to meet, uh, don't you, Bruce? I can think of a whole bunch of people. Who yeah. me, but... <laughs> well, I'm all only because we're also in the process of interviewing Mike May from uh, the Durango and Silverton. Uh, Mike, all right, uh, yes. Where uh, people of uh, th this podcast will come after the Mike May uh, 37 part trilogy, but uh, which is kind of kind of neat. After we talk to Mike, the next thing, the next uh, one will, that people will hear will be this one with Rob. But uh, he's uh, a guy that's worked on, on the railroad ever since he was like 21. And he's a locomotive engineer. One of the things he does is a locomotive engineer on the Durango and Silverton, which is a three-foot gauge railroad. You'd love talking to him. I, I know that railroad, actually. 
Um, you would be surprised, Lionel. There is a, a big North American rail enthusiast group here in Switzerland, and they have meetings each month. And, and uh, then they present the railroad, which some of the guys have visited in the US or in Canada. And then make they make a little um, slideshow and what they have experienced and all that. And they show the route they took and, and, and all that. And one of the... One of the evenings, they talked about the uh, Durango and Silverton Railroad. Okay, well, there you go. So tell me about that. So like you say, it's uh, pretty, North American railroading is pretty popular amongst modelers in Switzerland. How, how popular is model railroading in Switzerland, roughly? It is pretty popular. I, I, I couldn't tell you exact numbers, but, but Mariclean ever since had a huge, huge footprint in, in Switzerland. And uh, there are quite a quite a lot of uh, model railroad enthusiasts here. Most of the people here, of course, uh, build um, narrow gauge railroads like the, the Rettischbahn, which is a very, very popular railroad in the southern part of Switzerland. And then, of course, we have our own federal railway, which, which offers a lot of, of possible layouts and, and, um, and, and topics and scenes. And there are quite a few North American railroad modelers here as well. So now you said two things that I didn't understand at that last, uh, you said, <laughs> there was something you said at the very start of that statement. And then you said, did, did you get all of that, Bruce? Bruce? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was listening. I'm going, okay. But and then, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, I will give it the second try. <laughs> yeah, this is only so, yes. talk a little railroading. Talk a little slower so I can stop you when we get to the part I didn't understand. Okay, very good. So I started with the statement that model railroading actually is is uh, very popular in in Switzerland, in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. I think this would be the the three main model railroading nations, and maybe the Netherlands as well. Right. And uh, most of the people, of course, collect and model. Uh, Swiss or German-related trains and railroads because they offer a lot of, of, uh, of equipment, of course, and it's easier to get stuff and prototype pictures. And rail fanning is way easier if you model a Swiss-based railroad, of course. But there is quite a big um, North American railroad enthusiast group here. And some of the guys do have model trains as well. So some of the guys only rail fan when they are in the U.S. And their most uh, main interest is the is the real railroad, the prototype. But some of the guys actually build American railroads in okay. their in their rooms. And and are, are, have you have you been to anywhere? Like, there's nothing wrong with shelf layouts. I'm a huge fan of shelf layouts, and I think it's uh, important. Uh, that uh, whether you can model uh, uh, a one meter by by a half a meter layout or whether you can model a five foot by a two foot layout or whatever, shelf, that's just as good as modeling a gigantic layout. So in have you visited other model railroaders and seen other layouts? Of course I have. Actually, uh, three very good friends of mine model American railroads. Right. Uh, one of them models NS East Coast, just as I do. Uh, another one focuses on West Coast, BNSF and UP. And the third one has a beautiful layout, uh, which is built upon a prototype in Montana. So he models the Montana rail link up wow. there in Montana. It's a beautiful layout. And these guys are all near you? Um, yes and no. <laughs> Two of them are pretty close to me. Uh, yeah. You wouldn't believe it's about 30 minutes by car. Well, there's uh, a surprise. <laughs> yeah, but the other one lifts, uh, lifts about, yeah, it comes close to two hours by car. Okay. One and a half hours, and that only if, if traffic is, is good. So, um, And there's no direct route. Um, so the, the one layout, the guy that is, what would the general size of these layouts be? Uh, I just tried to figure this out. So one of the guys has a layout, which is a double stack one, which goes around the whole room. I would have to ask him. So he rebuilds the whole layout and he started last year with that or maybe two years ago. And I don't have pictures of the layout yet, but scenery is already completed for a part. Uh, the Montana layout is close to close to finish. And the third one um, he's still working on the track plan and the upper part of his layout. So the, the, 
the upper level. Right. And how big? But they are pretty big, actually. Yeah, big like as in like uh, I don't know, like uh, like roughly how big would the room be? Um, so the one guy that has the BNSF UP layout, that room is about two and a half meters by I think six meters. Okay. And he goes all around the wall on two decks, so that's a pretty huge layout. Yeah. Then the Montana layout is about uh, three and a half meters by. I would say six meters as well. Okay. But he only operates on one deck, but that's a fairly big layout as well. And uh, the third one is the biggest one. That's the guy who models Norfolk Southern. That's Roger, a uh, good friend of mine. Um, I try to find pictures here, but I can't. So his layout room is about, he extended the room under his house. So it's about, I think it's about five by six meters or five by five. Wow. So these are like on 20. two decks. Yeah, that's a huge layout. Yeah, yeah. It's five by five meters would be fifteen, sixteen feet by sixteen feet on two decks. That's a good size layout for sure. Um, and yeah, our, especially if you consider that we are in in Europe. So yeah, uh, exactly. The I mean, of the houses are not that big and all that. So yeah, that's, that's no. a fairly big layout. Yeah, that's yeah, a big... just uh, to, for our, for our North America. That'd be about a typical, you know, spare bedroom size over here in North America. You know, that's uh, what I was thinking. By sixteen, twelve by twelve. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. They're, yeah. they're typical bedroom size layouts, yeah. which is a very popular size yeah. in North America for for medium size layouts. I mean. Yeah, the only people that big gi- uh, build giant layouts are people with big basements and stuff like that. And that's something that's important about model railroading is you don't want to be judged by the size of your layout. You want to be judged by the fact that you're having fun, period, end of sentence. Um, exactly. Lionel, I just found the, the original track plan. So the, the biggest layout is 19 by 17 um, feet. feet. Well, that's, okay. that's 20 right. by 20. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's about the size you had at your place, isn't it, Lionel? Yeah, well, yeah, the first iteration at the end, it was 20 by 30 feet. Yeah. Which actually seemed yeah. kind of small <laughs> to a lot of layouts. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't get over when Abley tells me, Uncle Dave says to me, because his layout, I think his area was roughly the same size as mine, maybe a bit bigger. And he'll have like 15 yeah. guys down there, 14, 15 guys he needs to operate it. And I'm thinking... We were happy with five or six, and we had a <laughs> that was and that was kind of crowded. Yeah, I know. Um, what about uh, what about uh, uh, is there any clubs in uh, Switzerland? There are some clubs actually, and uh, the reason I am building this uh, these segments, which are so precise, so one meter by by half a meter, is that my system allows me to join other guys' modules. So okay. we, we made kind of a club, if you want to call it. It's it's pretty loose uh, loose group we made. Uh, and uh, all of the guys are making the modules so that we can join them together if we decide to to make a, a modular meet one day somewhere in a, I don't know, in a, yeah. in a sports location or something like that. So are you building to the Fremo standards or something different? Yeah, it's it's okay. kind of a Fremo concept, actually, yes. All right. I'm not sure if it's the same dimensions as all, because there are several different Fremo dimensions as we research on the internet, but we use use one of them, yes. Okay. And how many guys you got that are doing this? I think in our group chat, we are a total of seven or eight guys. Okay. And these are guys... All... There are other clubs as well. Yeah, and these are guys that are around Switzerland, and you you found each other somehow on different pages. That's so that's the thing that people don't get versus like the hobby is now just so is so available. It's, it's so easy to find people who are like mind. Yeah, and and they don't have to be a long ways away. You know, <laughs> like they're no. just around the corner, uh, or they or they can be a long ways away. They can either be in uh, in Georgia somewhere in a Georgia, or they can be in Switzerland and still be just as close yep. friends that way. Um, uh, I had a good question. Don't tell me what it was because oh yeah, so you guys, uh, you North American modeler guys, where do you get most of your supplies? So um, we had three different hobby shops here, which were um, specified for for American stuff. One of them closed a couple of years ago, and there are two others uh, which are still in business today. And um, 
well, most of the stuff actually works via pre-order. So you have to, to watch out online what comes next and you make a reservation for your product. And once it's here in Switzerland, you get an email and then you can pick it up at the store if you want. What's the name of one? What's the name of the of your favorite store? So the one closest to me and my favorite one is trainmaster.ch. Trainmaster.ch. Okay, we're back to the, the favorite part of the podcast. Dot ch. So what is ch? Is that Switzerland? Yes, it's Switzerland. That stays for the Latin name of Switzerland, which is Confederatio Helvetica. Of course. That's what I actually I was just saying that to Bruce the other day. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, I knew you knew that. Yeah, so. true, yes. <laughs> okay, so I found it, trainmaster.ch, and it's uh, yes. uh, by Werner Meir, U.S. Railroad Shop in Kilchberg. Yes, that's correct, uh, how, uh, which is about 20 minutes from where I was going to say, it's about 30 minutes. Oh, it's, 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 it's closer then. Yeah, it's really yeah, it's quick. it's 30 minutes if, if I have a traffic jam. Um, so it's got a fair size store. It does. He has a big, uh, this is a pretty cool, uh, what you got a good size website. Oh, the future of the U S railroad shop in Kilchberg. Click here. Uh, because of high yeah, shop. So, rent, uh, it says he's uh, going to close the shop actually. Right. So, but, um, he still remains, uh, as an online dealer. So you, you just come pre-order your stuff and pick it up. But the store itself, um, is going to close. Right. And I think that's uh, the way of so many things. However, that doesn't mean that people are going necessarily going out of business. They're just uh, using doing everything via the internet. Yes, exactly. And that's where my my friends and I get most of most of our stuff. So whenever a product is available at um, at Walters, then I make a pre order via Trainmaster. But if it comes down to, for example, Tangent, Arrowhead, Exact Rail, or Scale Trains, or uh, well, Rapido. Yeah. Then I make a pre-order online, and uh, usually we order as a group. That uh, makes uh, makes it a little bit cheaper for the for the shipping costs. And okay. We split up the shipping costs in the whole in the whole process. So how do you guys get yourself organized enough to order as a group? Like uh, the guys will say, "Hey, like have like uh, the new forty four tonners out. Who wants a wants to order a forty four tonner? Is that kind of how it goes?" Yeah, exactly. So, for example, when I make a pre-order for, um, there is a new rolling stock coming from from um, Aurora in in Canada, which you might know. I think you, oh, yes. you interviewed the guy before. What's the guy's name? Ben. Ben. Aurora yeah, model. exactly. Ben, ben with his. Yes. Oh yeah, Ben. Yeah. Uh, other stuff. Aurora. Yeah, Aurora models. Yeah, there you go. Aurora miniatures. Aurora miniatures. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So then I made a I made a post in our group chat and I told the guys, hey guys, I'm gonna pre-order the box car. If you want one, then just let me know how many you want and which number, and then I'm gonna make an order. Okay, so somebody will le- somebody will take the lead on a particular model, and uh, everybody will jump in and say, yeah, get me three of that one or one of that one, and and whoever takes the lead on a particular purchase is the guy that uh, looks after it. Perfect. Yes, exactly. That's uh, that's pretty smart. You guys are pretty smart. Yeah. Um, so now, I, when, when well, we have to because shipping costs are, are enormous. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, when, for when example, place... if, I, if, I want two, if I want two box cars from, let's say, Exact Rail, then I pay a total of 100 bucks for the two box cars and an additional 60 to 70 bucks for shipping costs. And then we, of course, have import tariffs as well because we import something from another country, which makes sense. Yeah. Now, now are you ordering direct from manufacturers? Or you uh, order from a hobby shop over in the North America? Well, I, I, I sometimes I do both. So, for example, um, I really love the rolling stock made by Exact Rail. So, whenever that is available, I order through Train Life. Then, for example, Arrowhead, I made a direct order. That's how I um, made contact to to Blaine Hatfield, which I also uh, actually I, I write him from time to time via Messenger. He's a great guy. He makes wonderful cars. And uh, I also made a made an order through Midwest because actually I had coupons there because um, when I joined the Down and Dirty Weathering Contest, I was one of the winners and uh, Midwest Model Railroad was the sponsor. Right. Um, so then I, I, I got a, a code and then I was able to to order some stuff from his beautiful shop. Uh, I got to get you a T-shirt. Did you get a T-shirt with a hot dog on it? Yeah. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. But I have to make a second order and get that T-shirt. Wow. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. I got to. All right. Let's, I'm going to look you up here on Patreon. Let's see. There you are. Boom. 
uh, uh, yeah, you just joined on uh, about th- three weeks or four weeks ago. Way to go. Um, and, yes, exactly. And now you got all that stuff to listen to. Uh, don't be like Joe Desmond, though, about listening to it while you're on duty. You're no, gonna... I'm not allowed to do that, actually. No. <laughs> But whenever I am in my hobby room and I work on the layout, actually, um, I usually listen to to podcasts related stuff, and it also helps me to to learn English and make a little bit uh, progress in the in the language as well. Your English is great. Your English is great. Like, uh, I mean, thank you. That's that's that's. I'm glad to hear <laughs> because I really try my best. I, most of the stuff I learned uh, through through Netflix and podcasts and YouTube movies. <laughs> really. You self yes. you self taught yourself English and 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 this yeah is... kind of I, I had English at school to be fair enough but that right. was just the basics like hi my name is Robin I am from Switzerland but all the other stuff especially if it's it comes down to to, to trains for example PTC and NS and all that stuff that's what I learned uh, via YouTube channels like Seaboard Central and NS Modeler Twenty Four. Holy mackerel! Your English is great. If that's how you've taught yourself, I mean, it, like... it's better than my grade twelve German. That's for sure. Yeah, well, it's better. <laughs> It's better than my English now, but then of course. Yeah, I... my French is horrible, though. Yeah, well, so is mine. <laughs> I have I had French I have... at school, but I really hated it. Yeah, I have a joke about. All right, this is my friend. I probably shouldn't say it, and I apologize to anybody. I, uh... Uh, Serge, I apologize if. Uh... But my only French I know is uh, Johnny shoot the puck, and uh... or uh... I shoot the puck, and Johnny make the die for it, eh? Uh, what do you think, Bruce? Should I cut that out? <laughs> I, I'm thinking cut that out. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so, okay. So let so, um, you guys are gonna, so uh, you guys have, uh, so do you have belong this, uh, you say you go to these, uh, meetings where they have slideshows and that, is this a club or is this just a bunch of guys that get together? Um, no, it's it's actually it's a it's a group called uh, the American Railroad Fans of Switzerland. I'm gonna send you the link just right here. Yeah, send me the link. Send me yeah, the... it's a Facebook group. Just a second here. No, it's a uh, Facebook here it is, group. Lionel String. Here is the link. Yes, so that's a Facebook group. Uh, or no, actually, it's a, it's a regular group, but they have a link on Facebook, and that's when they post their um, their dates. Uh, it's usually at the end of the month. Okay. One evening, it's usually Friday, and then we have a meeting, and one of the guys um, then will make a little slideshow, or uh, or um, he introduces a railroad, and for example, a good friend of mine, one who built the Montana Rail Link uh, layout, he was in Montana, I think, at the end of twenty two. Right. And then he made tons of pictures, of course, because um, MRL is going to be part of BNSF. Yeah. So he, he want to capture the last remaining MRL paint locomotives, which I also have two actually, as the seventies beautiful right. locomotives. And then he he showed us the tour he went from where to where, and and all the, the the stations they were, and all the locomotives. And he made some some shortcut movies and pictures. It, it was a great show. Uh, it looks like in February twenty 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 three, uh, cinders and smoke. About the uh, uh, Cajon spe- spectacular, is, is is that uh, is that is that the twenty? Okay, I found the meetings. It looks like February twenty fourth, April twenty eighth, maybe. So what day? What day? What's uh, free tag? What day is that? It says F R E I. That's Friday for Friday. So you usually have yes. them on Friday evenings. Yes, exactly. All right. And actually, that word translates one by one to Friday. It's like like a free day. Ah, uh, okay. I knew that. You knew that, eh, Bruce? Uh, I knew what Friday was. <laughs> oh, and it's are they? Uh, do you have these at the at the Train Master store? Uh, what? Uh, these meets. It looks like you're having these meets at the train. Oh no, sorry. Yeah, okay. No, so the the meetings are not at the store. They are in a. Uh, actually, it's a new location they found. It's um, I think it's on the upper level of a, of a restaurant oh okay if i'm correct i wasn't in the new in the new hall actually so far the, so at the end of this this month i'm gonna be there for the first time since we have the new location right so i'm looking forward to that um what about uh train shows in switzerland are there are there model railroad uh train shows 
Yeah, they are mostly, of course, focus on European stuff. Sure. Um, but there is one which is mixed, um, which is in Hochdorf, which translates to High Town. Okay, and that's about thirty minutes away. And they have a they have a, <laughs> a museum steam railroad which is still in operation. So once oh. or twice in a year, they operate a little steam locomotive and an older electric locomotive, and they make a little uh, little fun rides. Okay. It's kind of an excursion train, if you want to call it that way. And inside the hall, then they have, um, I think it's, it's two days. They have, a, they have different, several different layouts which they show, and these ones are mixed. So you have Eastern European stuff, Canadian stuff, American, Swiss, German, um, and they rotate. So each year you will see new layouts and, and new model, model builders. So it's, it's, uh, it's a great show. It's not that big, but it's, it's fine. And what, what town did you say it was in? Uh, that's in High Town, which is about thirty. So in Hochdorf, I'm yeah. gonna send you a message just yeah. a second here. And it's about and that's about thirty minutes away. <laughs> Wouldn't you think, Bruce? Uh, actually, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> uh, it is yeah, about. It, is, it, it looks like it's about thirty it minutes. Is, it is yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just work the Google machine on the internet. It comes about to 30 minutes by car. Listen to this guy. I'm go, kidding here. Listen to this guy. He goes, I would just work the Google machine on the internet. Look at, yeah, yeah. I, hope, I hope we're not teaching you slang that you're using that people are kind of looking. What does your girlfriend think of all your, uh, of your enthusiasm for model railroading? Uh, she's very supportive of the whole thing, actually. Okay. Okay. And... Uh, and uh, so I got a question for you. I think as we were, you were talking about the this place where the shows are and they have a little steam engine in North America, uh, railroad preservation is a big deal. Like it seems like it's a bigger deal than I even realized. Like it seems like we were talking to well when we talked the first time we the first episode with Mike May we stumbled across this uh, this uh, railroad. That neither one of us knew any, none of us knew anything about. What was it called, Bruce? It was called the something or another. It was in Indiana, somewhere. Uh, oh, the uh, just across the Michigan border. Yeah, at, yeah, uh, exit, uh, exit ninety on ninety the off history, 90. history, history yeah. of steam or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, there is, is uh, railroad preservation and history, and uh, is huge. Well, there's a picture on the. On your uh, Facebook page of the, uh, the your group, your American Railroad fans in Switzerland, the the, the main picture is the big boy pulling the Union Pacific yes. train. So, I mean, in uh, in Europe or in Switzerland, does, or for whatever you know, is uh, is railroad preservation a thing, or is or the other second part of this question would be is because railroads are so efficient and so common in Europe. Is railroad preservation really not much of a thing? Okay, so let me answer this in, in different way. Our railways, railroads here are, um, are, are federal companies. So that means they have a specific budget for the, for the operation and, and the stuff they have to do. So when it comes to railroad preservation, of course, there are several different clubs and enthusiast groups and all of that, but it's it's a bit more more different. So, for example, we don't have this um, this these special trains like like Union Pacific has and CSX and NS with all these these heritage paint schemes and all of that because that costs money. So that's a little bit different. But um, there, the Federal Railway has an actual. Um, railroad preservation group in which they they try their best to to um, to to still offer some museum trains, older locomotives which are not longer in service, but they have a huge reputation. For example, the Crocodile, which is a world famous locomotive, or well, it's very famous here, and um, they still it's offer famous enough. The Lego offer. made a model of it. Yes, exactly. It's that one. Yes. And there was some of them were green, some of them were brown. Um, so the real ones, and they still have one in operation, which uh, moves from time to time with, with excursion trains, but they're quite costly. It's it's pretty expensive. And they use all that money to to keep the locomotive on track and, and to make it work and all that. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's one. So it, it is a bit, 
it, it is a big thing, but it is different. Just like the whole railroad operations as a whole, there are huge differences between Europe and 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 the oh, US yeah. and Canada in particular. Yeah, there's huge differences, but uh, yeah, because uh, I, I don't know, maybe what's the, is the right way to say North American, North American. They kind of move on and scrap everything, so then people get want to preserve what the past was. Whereas, like we said uh, not that long ago, Bruce, we were talking to somebody, don't remember who, but uh, uh, being a rail fan is kind of like being. I, mean, we're, I think we we're talking to Chris Brimley, and being a ra- being a rail ro- rail fan photographer is kind of like preserving history. You're chasing history. Like uh, yes. in uh, North America, rail fan photography is very much about uh, chasing history and recording history. Whereas in Europe, trains are much more, trains are, are passenger trains are much more an integral part of the way people move ac- from place to place. Like, Yes, yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And also they are very, very uniform. So for example, you have this Swiss company called um, Stadler. Stadler, um, it's a railroad manufacturer, and he sells his his commuter trains all over the world. So actually, there some of his trains are in in California and in Texas as well, mm. and in the whole of Europe, he sells hundreds of these things. And uh, but they they look very uniform. So it's kind of like if you would say so in in Canada and the U.S., you now have basically two locomotives. You have the Jevos and the ST seventy ACEs. So these are the two cabin designs you have mostly on the railroads there are no more gp38s gp35s yes of course you still have some remaining in service but i would say like 80 percent of the of the trains now have dash nines gvos and st70 acs and it's not that that different and the variety is, is way smaller than it was for example like 30 years ago i would assume with all these GP units and the SD units and all that. So it's way more uniform. And, and I think that is something that, uh, that goes the same route here in Europe. So with, with less different uh, locomotive types, you have less different parts. And that makes maintenance and the costs way easier yeah. to handle all this. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah. Right. I think in North America, they'll always be like uh, local. So locom- that's a question. Like the locomotives in North America... You, it, it's not that hard to find a GP9 somewhere that's still in active service. And there's probably hundreds of them in North America that are still in active service here and there. And all... all th- there's one right in Barrie. There's one in Barrie. There's two in Barrie, isn't there? The, uh, the one I'm sure, uh, the calling uh, the Barrie Collingwood Railroad. Yeah, they have more than one locomotive, though, I think, don't they? Well, they might have two. I, they might have two yeah. I think I've seen them double-headed pretty much. And uh, yeah, so there you go. So there's a place right there where they have them. So... In uh, in Europe, uh, old locomotives don't really last, do they? I mean, the things are get pretty ext- – once they're done, they're extinct. They're gone. Yeah, exactly. So I think the, the big difference here, again, is that since we have federal railroads, if they decide to, let's say, locomotive X goes out of service, um, let's say a GP35, okay, so – we are they're going out of service. We are going to buy new locomotives, for example, ST40-2. So all the GP35s are going out of service piece by piece, but it will be within a short, a relatively short time. And since there are less, less, um, so you don't have a lot of private companies here operating trains. Um, you don't have sellers for these older locomotives. So therefore, they are going to the scrapyard. And right. then the Federal Railway gets new locomotives. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. usually how it works. And then you don't have, for example, an RJ Corman who buys older NS locomotives to operate his own layout, yeah. uh, railroads or not layout railroad. So they are going to the scrapyard. And in the US and Canada, I assume they go to, to a leasing company or to a smaller private company because most of the railroads are privately owned and operated. And that's yeah. the main difference, I think. R.J. Corman is actually a railroad that more people should pay attention to, more modelers should pay attention to in North America because that's a fantastic railroad. That's somebody else we should, that's somebody else we got to interview one of these days is the guys that work at R.J. Corman. Man, that would have been. Yeah, and cool. the paint scheme is very nice. I oh, think. my God, it's uh, fabulous. And the last time. It's amazing. It is. I managed, I managed to stumble across one of those not that long ago, last summer. A train. I was just happened to turn a corner, and I could hear a train. I think I stopped to to look for, at the map, 
and I thought I heard a train off in the distance, and sure enough, it was an R.J. Corman with a couple of Jeep 35s or Jeep 38s on the head end. And uh, Was that in Canada, Lionel? That was in Pennsylvania. Ah, RJ, RJ, so, RJ, uh, yeah. Do they operate in Canada? No, they do not. R.J. Corman is primarily okay. Pennsylvania area. Uh, I don't even, I don't know if they go, I don't even know if they go outside the state of Pennsylvania. I'm not sure. I think Pennsylvania, Ohio, aren't they? No, Pennsylvania and Ohio. There you go. Exactly. Okay. Uh, okay. Before we leave, we're starting to run out of time. So before we leave, I want to ask you a little bit about, so you're going off to be a policeman. Yes. And this must be kind of an exciting time in your life, eh? It is. It is. The, The school is very interesting. All the stuff we learn is very fascinating. And uh, will you will you work? You're going to work in Lucerne, did you say? Is that where you're going to be? Yes, that's right. All right, which is a thirty minute, which is about thirty minutes away. Now, will you work all kinds of goofy shifts, like because you're 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 new into the you know you're low on the ranks, you're an, you're a young guy. Will you be what kind of shifts do you work as a police officer in in Switzerland? Like time. Yeah, they are pretty goofy to say the least. <laughs> they are <laughs> very different than than all the other stuff. Um, other folks work. Uh, the thing is, as a as a as a locomotive engineer and as a track worker before, I had a lot of different shifts as well. So, as long as I worked already, which is not a lot, of course, since I am only thirty years old. But since I ever started working, I always worked in shifts. So that is nothing new to me. Right. Okay. So one of the shifts, for example, is you start at five thirty in the morning until eleven thirty in the middle. Um, and then you go home for about six hours. You try to have a little sleep, and then you come back, and then you have a, a twelve-hour uh, shift straight through wow. the night. Wow! Wow! <laughs> so in so in uh, twenty-four hours, you're going to be be on on duty like eighteen of the twenty-four hours. Yeah, kind of. Yes. Wow. Of course, you have the six hour, which you you can use to sleep. But for example, so we, um, while we while I was at school, we we had the opportunity to go out to our police unit for one week and join them, in real life, and that was very interesting. And then I had this shift, and that was that was pretty pretty interesting. So there was some some snowfall, and there were a lot of traffic accidents. So we had to work overtime. Okay. And that, of course, shortened your time at home from six hours to about four and a half, five hours, which you have left to sleep. But then you have to keep in mind that you have also go through the snow back to your police station. So yes. you never, ever had that six hours sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so, sure. yeah, that, that was a pretty long day, actually. <laughs> your your English is fantastic, considering you've learned yeah, it. Yeah, I, I try hard over here, trust me. <laughs> so is that going to be a, an asset to you as a police officer that you're fairly f- that you're fluent in English? Uh, I don't know. Actually, Switzerland is very international. So we have a lot of tourists here, a lot of business people, a lot of different uh, different visitors, but also people from from other countries working here in Switzerland. So um yeah, I really hope that that English is going to be something that I can use on the streets. Uh, I, I I was able to use it as a locomotive engineer because, as I said, we had a lot of tourists um, where I worked. Right. So some American and Canadian guests as well, of course, and guests from India and all over the world. And English is, is the easiest way to go. Yeah. And uh, also there is Hungarian, which I can use, but that's not a very typical language. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what is uh, – what are your – what are your uh... – What's the next thing you want to buy? What's the how much? How many locomotives do you have? At scale locomotives um, comes down to about fifty locomotives in total, <laughs> I think. What is it with model railroad? Yeah, I think it's forty to fifty locomotives. And, what, what, what is it um, with our um, open models? I was just going to say, what is it with model railroaders, and we all we all end up with like way more stuff than we need. I don't know. That's the big question. That n- none of us ever could answer i think but okay. it's the same with all of my friends over here in switzerland i have rolling stock for leo that is i don't know four stacks high but <laughs> yeah i don't have I've, i don't have the room for them so but it must be fun uh let's talk about it. it must be this is something i often say is like the difference now having a well we said 12 feet by uh foot and a half uh railroad uh, uh Four, four meter, a meter by four meters by a meter and a half. Um, 
the difference now is you must enjoy when you get a locomotive doing, you know, programming it and doing all the sorts of things that, you know, with the lights and all the, the horn and all that sort of stuff. I think that's one of the things that makes having a small layout just as much fun as having a big layout. I agree. And one thing that I, that is really um, important for me, and I think it's it's kind of the my favorite part of the hobby, um, if you if you want to go with the Kelly question, what is the favorite thing I do? It's weathering. I love to weather my stuff. Right. You can be. You so be. my locomotive, since I I don't really have the knowledge to do the DCC and the lighting work, and these brass locomotives in particular are pretty difficult to do. I have a gentleman in the US who makes all the sound and uh, DCC and light installations in in my brass locomotives. Then he sends them to me, and I weather them. Now, how many brass locomotives do you have? I only have brass locomotives. No, that's that's not true. Two of them are plastic. You only have brass hmm. locomotives. Well, this yes, is a, this is an important wow. piece of information we need to know early on. Yeah, I, I'd be looking. I figure out oh, he's you know got the latest offering from the top, uh, yeah, manufacturers, but uh, such is not the case. So why is that? Why do you feel? Why is it that you only have brass locomotives? So um, actually, I started with with plastic with uh, with Arthur locomotives. I had Broadway Limited, um, Atlas, and, and all the other big names. Scale Trains, of course, makes fantastic locomotives. So the thing is, um, once I visited my friend with the with the big Norfolk Southern layout, he is into Olin models as well. And when I was there, he showed me two or three locomotives. And once I saw them, I decided that since I don't need hundred or two hundred locomotives. Um, I, I don't need the, the quantity. I prefer the quality. And uh, so that's n- nothing against plastic. They have fantastic quality as well nowadays. So the, the thing is, for, for me personally, uh, an Overland brass locomotive is, is a handmade piece of engineering. It's just, it's fascinating to see all the, all the craft work that goes into it, into the special locomotives. And of course, they are way more durable since if a, if a brass locomotive falls over, you don't have any problems at all. But if a, if a beautifully detailed plastic locomotive falls over, then you might have some broken parts and you don't have these problems <laughs> with brass locomotives. How many of your? And they are in. So for me personally, they are they are just unique, and that's what makes them fascinating. So how many of your brass locomotives have you? How how often are you knocking over your locomotives? I think you might have a problem there if you're constantly knocking them over. Well, not too often. <laughs> Maybe it's just the reason I say because I just simply love these brass locomotives, <laughs> and I had no other answer <laughs> to your question. So do you buy mostly from? Uh, I see. I just. Uh, opened up overland models and uh, it's so do you buy mostly from overland no um all my units so actually when when i started into this uh, brass collecting thing overland already left the market and stopped all all brass imports so i kind of i was one of the guys who who actually came late to the party so um most of my stuff is online through contacts, through Facebook group, through through other guys that know of a guy who has a locomotive that I want. And once you spread the word, then you kinda kinda find the names online which you have to to contact and tell them. Um there there was a good example. I just wrote to a guy, hey, um I have seen you posted a picture of your breast locomotive. If you ever decide to sell, please let me know. And uh, we never talked to each other again. And um, two or three years later, the guy was like, hey, you asked for the NS Jivo. You still want it? <laughs> so uh, have... then we ended up um, trading four locomotives. That was a great day. <laughs> trading. Okay. Another aspect of the hobby. So have you uh, ever heard of resource rails? Yes, I did. And actually, that's another company that I sent an email as well. What's the guys in Ocala? And that was right after I heard the, the interview uh, on the AML network. Okay, well, there you go. Next time you I ta- think you interviewed Matt. Is that correct? Yeah, Br- Matt Dowd, yeah. Who's also... Yes, exactly. That's the gentleman who I talked to. Um, who's also a friend of... Uh... Where do you hear these uh, Mike May interviews? Holy mackerel. By now, you would have heard them because your interview will be after after his 47-part trilogy. Of course. And, uh, man, what do you hear this stuff? It's just, it'll just blow your socks off. Uh, BrassTrains.com in Ocala, Florida. Ocala, Florida. Ocala, Florida. Have, have you ever dealt with them? 
Um, yes, I have two locomotives which were directly from breast trains. Okay, so so you there. This is fascinating. You should have told this. Say, why don't I ask the right questions, Bruce? I never ask well, the right. Kind of like Kelly, you're waking up late in the game. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> who's? How did you find somebody? How did you find somebody in North America to do the lights and the decoders and all that stuff for you? Uh, that was actually pretty easy. That was a guy um, whose website I have seen before, and um, he makes most of his work is is related uh, and comes down to um, to fitting brass locomotives and and uh, make custom work on brass locomotives. And then I contacted him via I'm not sure if it was via email or Facebook, and I told him what my plans are. And ever since, that's the gentleman who makes all the custom work to my locomotives. So what's his website? So that's BradleyDCC.com. BradleyDCC.com. Now I've heard of him. I've heard of him before. We should interview him, Bruce. What's that? Yes, you guys definitely should. This this guy is absolutely fantastic. The, I mean, the the work he puts into a, into a locomotive and the the light work that he's able to do is just unbelievable. So, for example, I have an ST40-2, um, which is an RCO equipped locomotive. And uh, he even made the little strobes on the roof flashing. What's a RCO? Uh, so that's a rail um, radio controlled operation, RCO. Oh, okay. I knew that, Bruce. I was just testing him. So that's uh, that's <laughs> when you have a little radio control device for your locomotive and to, you don't have to right. stay inside the cab, actually. Okay. And that's something I, I did at work as well. When I worked at the maintenance department, we had locomotives with RCO equipment. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that, that'd be like what uh, George uh, well, did. He, yeah, uh, George, George, George. The hump yard in Toronto with the belt. Yeah, hat. exactly. They're mostly we use this stuff at hump yards. And, uh, and yeah, for example, for um, for maintenance of work, it, it comes handy as well. And since I use that uh, myself when I worked in the, in the maintenance department, I wanted a locomotive just like that. And, of course, I had to order the RCO guys from Mini Prince. There you go. There you go. That Mini Prince. Mini Prince. Yes. Uh, uh, our, yes, our, and they, they came at, um, I think it was right after Christmas, we made a group order from Bernard, and um, I had six, seven, or eight different products, which I ordered from him, and they are absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah, you hear that, Bernard, on the podcast, it's uh, sponsored by Rapido Trains, we're talking about miniprints.com, Mini, uh, Rapido Trains. You are fast track to model railroading fun. Rapido Trains, you're fast track to model Of course, I have uh, several cars from Rapido as well. Do you? There you go. Okay, that's good. Yes, they are absolutely beautiful cars. Um, uh, yeah, they are absolutely beautiful cars. RapidoTrains.com. If it's A, if it's H O, the best track is Rapido. I'm going to ask you one last question uh, because this is—I uh, don't think I've ever—I've never asked uh, this. You're our first interview ever from Switzerland. We have a we have an avid we have Nick Carlson who's come to two of our well he came to Tom Stock Nick came to Tom Stock and he's come to yeah, our our our, in Rochelle. and our and our picnic in Rochelle and he's a, a equipment manager for a hockey team in Switzerland. Yeah, but oh I really? Yeah. Do you know which team? No, I don't. I have the sweater hanging up in the northern studio, but I don't ha- I don't remember. There's too many people. You know what the problem is, uh, Rob, with uh, this podcast? You know there's too many people to interview. Yeah, and there's too many people listening. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> uh, because I talked to so many interesting people. Yeah, so I found Bradley DCC Custom Models. BradleyDCC.com. He'd be interesting to talk to as well. Um, yeah, definitely. So you talk to him quite a bit, I guess, eh? Uh, actually, on a weekly basis, sometimes. Really? Because if we are working on on different locomotives, then then the chat goes back and forth. What we are going to do next? And um, well, the the thing now is that since that I I I started at a new job and I am at school now, my my uh, my payment, of course, is way lower than before. So the problem now is actually to to spend the money, uh, get the money together, uh, to buy new stuff, and to to make other custom work. 
Right. Well, um, so so now we are not talking that often, but yeah, um, if we are working on on custom projects, then we are we are talking on a weekly basis. He sometimes sent me some pictures uh, when we when he's uh, trackside and shooting some pictures from NS locomotives and prototypes. Okay. Um, and uh, but once you get finished with your training for uh, at the police academy, then you'll be able to get back to buying locomotives and stuff. Yeah, I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, so tell me, I have this question for you. And you're in uh, Switzerland, and you're uh, fascinated by North American model uh, railroading, and you have you have a bunch of guys that you're all hanging out with and doing all kinds of stuff. What is it about this hobby? What what is it that dr- that uh, drives people to be in this hobby? What's the magic of this hobby? Why why are people in it? Why are you in Switzerland modeling North American railroads? What's the magic? I have thought about this question quite often, and I'm not sure if there is one simple answer to this. Maybe it's a mixture of several dispens- di- uh, different aspects of the hobby. So for when it comes down to model trains, maybe it's the, it's the chance to build a world in the way that you want it to have it. So for example, the, the landscape and the towns, you can make them just like you want them. Um, when it comes to the American prototypes, for me personally, the main reason why I choose American prototypes um, over Europeans is the fact that I worked for the railroad over here. So the stuff that moves here on the rails is the stuff that I see every day. So that's not particularly in- uh, interesting for me. But the American stuff is the is the the exotic stuff that is not right behind my door. So that's that's why I I started to to collect American trains and and to build an American layout. Because, uh, yeah, because makes... it's it's different. It's it's not that the stuff that is here. Yeah, that makes sense. It's uh, yeah, especially as a locomotive engineer, you'd be you you'd end up just modeling. Uh, now, did you know many other guys that worked on the railroad that were into the hobby of in the model railroading hobby? No, not really. Um, I was I worked for the railroad for about five to six years when I met the first guy. Um, that is the gentleman who is building the BNSF UP um, West Coast layout. He's okay. a locomotive engineer as well. His name is Martin, a very good friend of mine. Of mine, um, I visited his layout just two days ago, actually, and I helped him to um, to make some turnout uh, switch motors. We installed some switch motors. Okay, what kind? What, and, what like um, like tortoise or something, or what kind of switch motors were you installing? No, he uses cobalt from Australia. Okay. Really? Of course. Yes, he uses the, the Cobalt DCC uh, motors, and he, he gave me some for my own layout, but they are a bit noisy, actually, so I might gonna going to use a different one. Um, I still have two tortoises, uh, which I'm going to install and compare the, the loudness of them. I got some. Uh, I got some. Look at that. There's a Cobalt switch machine. Of course, of course, a guy in Switzerland would be using a switch machine from Australia. Like, what? why wouldn't he? Yeah, we, uh, I'm thinking a while back on one of the viewer mails, somebody was writing and looking for information on cobalt switch machines, and I think we found the cobalt website and sent him there to look for his information. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, they're pretty good, actually. CC, cchobbies.com, uh, cobalt uh, track, uh, let's see. It doesn't tell us uh, how do we know they're from Australia? I guess it doesn't. There's no about us here on this page. Wait a minute. There's the bottom of the page. Shipping. Oh, here's a map to Cobalt uh, to CC Hobbies. Here we go. Cherry Street uh, in Torrington. Well, it's no. It's uh, Cobalt's in Torrington, uh, Wyoming. It's not in really. Australia. Yeah, it's not in Australia. You've let us down. Are you sure? Because somebody told me they are coming from Australia. The the gentleman who imports no. them in Switzerland told me he can't oh, okay. get any, and they are coming from Australia. I, I'm not sure on that actually. But maybe CC Hobbies is just a maybe it's just a store, and, and uh, they just happen to sell them. I don't know that much about them. There's too much. Yeah, I think it's probably just a product they're selling. Okay, we'll give up on that. Um, man, there's too much. There. So much to talk about. All right, we got to call. We got to stop now. We're running out of network time. Um, okay. <laughs> what a, your English is great. Your English is really, really good. You should be very proud of yourself. I'm glad to hear that's still a lot to learn. Yeah. 
Well, uh, here's the key phrase you need to learn. Here's the one and only phrase you need to learn. Go Leafs, go. If you got that down, if you got that down pat, you're good to go. I'm just going to make a note here. Yeah. Go, go Leafs, Leafs, go. go. Yeah. There you go. And it's spelled L E A. It's spelled L E A F S. Yeah. That's all you need to know. That'll take you a long ways. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's a hockey yeah. team. Is that right? Or is it not hockey? It's not. It's not a hockey team. It's the hockey. It's the hockey team. team. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, actually, I learned a lot, a lot of phrases, and uh, actually, even some life advices through the podcast. So, um, I already know that I am not allowed to put hot dog on uh, ketchup on my hot dogs. Any there well, you there's go. There's a difference of opinion. Now, there right? you go. Now you're getting somewhere. You should never put ketchup on your hot dog over the age of eight. It's just the way it is. And never eat the green shrimp. Never eat the green because shrimp. Because Marty McGirt on it. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Uh, well, we're going to have to have you on again. You're going to have to go off now and uh, become a full-time police officer and and uh, get some adventures from that. And you're going to go have to go off and continue hanging out with your model railroad buddies in Switzerland. And then we'll have you on again. We'll, actually, you'll be. Uh, we'll have him on one time and do the Kelly questions for sure. But we no, fa- that would be amazing. But we've fallen a little behind on uh, broadcasting the Kelly questions, so I haven't done any for a while. <laughs> <laughs> because you know okay, what well just let me know i would love to be here again well you will be but you know what the problem is here's the problem and it's basically the reason i've fallen behind on the kelly questions and you'll appreciate this one of the reasons is it's because of guys like you who contact me and you're really really interesting and then i end up spending my time talking to you and you know I, we could do the kelly questions but we get keep getting piled up and there's more and more interesting people to talk to i see well then i think it's my fault yeah, I think so. Uh, Bruce, was that? I can live with that. Yeah, this has been a great podcast. Bruce, was that one we did last night? Was it any good? I think it will turn out great. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> when I was listening to it while we were talking, I was thinking, geez, we're boring. <laughs> it's, it's it, you know, it, it's one of those ones like we often say, you listen to it and you're thinking, really? And then when you, the final product comes on, it's going, oh. I'll exactly. Exactly. And here's something I'll tell you a little story about the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, that we'll leave with this. Uh, uh, Bruce, can I digress for a minute? Uh, uh, why would I stop you now? Exactly. So uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, are, I live just north of Toronto, born and raised, and uh, that's my team. So uh, I have uh, regular seats there uh, provided to me by a friend who's da- who's, who the seats have been in his family as uh, season's tickets have been in his family since 1941. So that's what, like 85 years. And, uh, when they moved, when the Toronto Maple Leafs moved to a new arena, some 20 plus years ago, uh, he was one of the people that got to choose seats first. Uh, he was like, I don't know, 500th or 600th person to, uh, choose seats. And, uh, they took him to the lower level of the, of the arena and he was looking around, and then he said, "Has there been any seats chosen in the upper level?" So there had been no seats chosen in the upper level. So he went to the upper level, and he picked seats that were like the front row of the upper level, uh, just past, uh, right around the blue line of the end that uh, where the Leafs attacked two out of three periods. And my son can, uh, and I continued to enjoy these seats. And then about ten years ago. Because we just love these seats because they're like almost eye level with uh, the big uh, screens. Uh, You can see everything. You're not that far away. Blah, 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 blah. So I turned to my son and I said, are these like the, we we have decided these are the best seats in the whole arena. And we're absolutely convinced of that. And then I said to my son one day, we were talking and I said, is Toronto not the center of the hockey universe? And he says, well, yeah, because the Hockey Hall of Fame is there and it's where the NHL headquarters are. And I said, yeah, like Toronto's the center of the hockey universe and we have the best seats in the arena. So I said, are we not sitting at the center of the hockey universe? I literally have the two seats that are in the center, that are the, the magnetic north of the hockey universe. And that's my story. That's all I got. That, and, and it's and it's a true story. And it's a true story. Why are some of my stories? You, you, what what are you? Explaining? No, no. I, <laughs> some people may think that some of your stories are not factual, but in fact, this is a very much a true story. Yeah, exactly. You nearly stepped on the minefield there, Bruce. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, boy, this has been a lot of fun, Rob. I'm glad this worked out. And Bruce, I'm glad you were available. We did this within like, we did this with absolutely no notice. I uh, brought Rob yeah. and I were wanted to test out his audio. And because there's a seven hour. Yeah, I, that's true. Yeah, we were seven hour uh, difference in time. And then I wasn't doing anything. And then I sent a text to Bruce and I said, are you doing anything? And he says, no. And I said, you want to interview a guy from Switzerland? And Bruce says, sure. When? I said, now. <laughs> and that's what we did. We interviewed Jeff. And, then, and, there we, and there we go. And there we go. And a minute and 45 minutes, an hour and 45 minutes later, done. Uh, Bruce, can you give out our email address? Yes, our email address. Uh, send us an email. And particularly if you've got any global stories of moderating and, uh, uh, but it's been fascinating. We'd like to, if you've got any questions for uh, Rob uh, about his layout and his life uh, railroading in Switzerland, uh, send us questions to modelerslife at gmail.com. That's modelers with one L, modelerslife at gmail.com. And uh, if you didn't catch that address, if you go to our website, amodelerslife.com, and you, uh, you just scroll down a little bit and click on the picture of the moderately agitated mailboy, in a particularly agitated state, boom. All you got to do is fill in the subject line and your text, and it's all done because the email will already have the address in it. Um, have you ever done that, uh, Robin, or do you uh, write the address out? Um, you, you mean the uh, an email to the... Have you ever clicked on the, the picture? Have you ever clicked on the picture of the moderately agitated mailboy? Oh, I did actually. The first email I sent was uh, the picture. <laughs> Perfect. Well, there you go. It works. We we know what happened. At least it, it does. It, does. It? it works perfectly well. <laughs> but, yeah, there you go. See, boom. All right. And uh, and also uh, on a modeler's life, you're if you're you're listening to this on the free channel, which by the way is uh, sponsored by Rapido Trains. Your fast track to model roading fun. Rapido Trains, your fast track to model. Uh, I love that expression. I don't, I, I was, uh, I'm not sure. We're going to have to find out if they like it, but I think it's great. Um, yeah. uh, what was I going to say? Well, he, 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 there's two thoughts on that. I have like, either they'd like it or Jason has them in listening and they don't know it exists yet. So yeah, I was, when I was over at the Rapido booth, I interviewed Bill Schneider and Matt Gentry yeah. and a couple other people. And I kept hinting about our, our slogan. And I was waiting for somebody to go, oh, yeah, that's a great slogan. And it was nothing. I got like, I got, I got dead mm, air. Crickets. You got the crickets. Yeah, I got yeah. the crickets. Uh, what mm. was I going to tell her? Oh, yeah. So you're listening to this on the free channel, which is sponsored by Rapido Trains. Your fast track to model roading fun. If it's A, if it's H O, the fast track is Rapido. And if you want twice as much uh, a podcasting, that's every Monday is the free channel, and every Tuesday is the Patreon channel. And all you have to do is go on the same website and click on the Patreon link, and boom, for just a few cents a day, you can have a twice as much podcasting every week, which is what you've done, Robin, and now you you have a whole pile more podcasts to listen to. Exactly. Yeah, pl pl plus, you get access to the Wednesday uh, afternoon slash evening uh patreon chat yeah which will be which starts at three o'clock what time is it right now it's uh coming up to don't tell me i gotta learn to do this on myself it's coming up to uh three plus you're coming up to 10 p.m in switzerland yeah that was close by <clears throat> i'm coming up to 9 p.m here oh is it only a six hour difference I think so. Yeah, you're right. It is, is it the same time zone as it is in New York where you are right now? Yes. Yes. Very and it's a six hour difference. Yes. Okay. I remember that when we were in New York the last time. It's exactly six hours. Okay. How often do you go to North America? Uh, I was there three times so far, and I try to go again as soon as I can. Yeah, so far. <laughs> and you can, mm -hmm. and you uh, just so you know, I have a Swiss Army knife uh, backpack that I use. So just so you know that I, I support your home. Yep, there you go. Yeah. Um, How do you like it? I love it. I love everything about Switzerland. Very good. I got to go to Switzerland. That's what I should do. Yeah. Let me know if you come. I will. You'd be the first person I tell, and Nick will be. Well, actually, I think I should tell Nick first, and then I'll tell you. I think that would be fair. Because you're two, because I got, we've got two avid fans in Switzerland that we know of. We got to find the rest of them. Um, 
Well, we just got to get our friend Reinvery here to put the word out when he goes to his meeting. Hey, yeah, listen to me on this podcast that's coming up, and you know, get them on it. I bet you'll be pretty popular once the, your your interview comes out and everybody can listen to it. All of a sudden, you'll be big man on campus. Yeah, I think so too. I have to change my name again. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I always observe the speed limit. Yeah. You know, I'm always observe the speed limit when I'm uh, when I'm driving. I always observe the speed limit, but uh, I don't. Okay, but uh, in <laughs> no, of course I do. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. But uh, if I come over to Switzerland and uh, you happen to feel the need to pull me over, try to remember how much fun you had on this interview. Okay. No, I definitely will keep that in mind. Okay, that seems fair. Um, I think we've covered everything, have we not, Bruce? Oh, uh, uh, Robin, have you ever wanted a T-shirt with a hot dog on it? I certainly want one, yes. Uh, if you go to Midwest Model Railroad, and their URL is MidwestModelRR.com, and you scroll across the navigation bar to Other, um, and click on the Other, uh, you'll see that the AML Nation is there. And you just click on the AML nation. We, we, we do have we do have top listing on other. Yeah, we do have only by, by alphabetical order. This well, is, it doesn't matter. We're still number one. That's true. Under other. Under other. Yeah, there you go. Other. Um, we got to get. I've got to get him. I've I interviewed him about that. It's at uh, at uh, Springfield, which you probably heard by now. But anyways, you click on other. Boom. You go to the AML Nation, and boom, you're in a wonderland of uh, merchandise, AML merchandise, hats, hoodies, mugs, T-shirts, whatever you could need. And in there is a T-shirt with a hot dog on it. So there you go. I'm going to order that, I think. All right. I think that's a good idea. And get a hold of your friends and see how many they want. <laughs> yeah, yes. of course. Um, let's see. I think that now that's it. We're done now, Bruce. Yeah, we, we've had the Patreon. We've talked about uh, emailing. We've talked about Midwest Model RR. Uh, we've talked that's about That's it. Check, check, and check. I think this is yeah. our best one ever about uh, treating Rapido trains properly, isn't it? it? We've come very, I think we did very well. Yeah, we've come a long ways. All right. Uh, are you ready, uh, Robin? I am. Well, Robin. As with the key here, the key here is what we need you to say is happy rails to you. Now, there's no. I remember that. Is okay. dancing and singing still not allowed? There's no, there's no dancing. There's no singing. Okay. There's no interpretation. It's just happy rails or yeah, happy rails to you, said with enthusiasm. Okay, I try my best. <clears throat> well, Robin, as we close the barn doors on another episode of a modeler's life, and the sun slowly sit, sinks over the back. Man, I'm doing a lousy job of this. Let's start again. <laughs> and, and you're even reading the script, aren't you? I'm reading it right off, of, <laughs> right off the screen. Oh, well, man. Yeah, I know. Eh? It's pathetic. But I'm excited that we're talking to a guy from Switzerland. Uh, well, with, absolutely. The first time we talked to a guy from Switzerland on the air. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Robin, or, well, or Rob. Do you prefer Rob or Robin? Uh, actually, Robin. Rob is really just for Facebook purposes. Okay. Well, Robin, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life and the sun slowly sets over the back 40, I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say... Happy rails to you. and Busted Knuckle, guests of A Modeler's Life podcast, stay at the Casa del Sol, Motocorton Inn, where late night dancing at the Rumber Room is a magical event to be experienced. It's another Lincoln Homer. Excellent.
job. I wouldn't, uh, I'd try not to listen, uh, try not to improve your English too much by listening to the AML podcast, though. That might not necessarily be a good thing. Yeah, it might be a degradation, yes. Yeah, it might be a step. I got a feeling that's a step backwards for you. <laughs> for me? No, nah, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, <I'm- laughs> I got. If you listen to our podcast. Yeah, I got the Sud. I got the Sudbury slur. You don't want that in Switzerland.